couple of things that are coming up. Um, in March, we have a gardening in New England. It's an organic gardening presentation by Vincent Cicero. I'm sure I did not say that right. Um, it should be really interesting. He wrote a book about organic gardening, and he's a master gardener. And he'll have his book with him and answer questions and all and talk about organic gardening, which is gardeners are already starting to set them up, um, their gardens. Our book sale starts March 15th, and it runs through the 27th. That's always a good time to get all your must-reads, um, and it supports the library. It's one of our biggest um, fundraisers as far as um, our steady annual, biannual fundraisers. So do come in. There's lots of good things. Um, all by donation, too. Um, and then we have a program that is called Cryptanalysis in Classical Literature by Dr. Michael Schroeder, and that'll be really interesting. Um, that is on March 19th. So just a few things that'll be happening coming up in March to beat those winter doldrums. Tonight, though, we have, like, sunshine here in front of me. I mean, I need my sunglasses. We have Ron and Jared Tuverson that have come to talk about their craft and their trade and their artwork um, as far as gilding. I don't pretend to know anything about gilding, so I'm going to let you guys talk about that. But I understand... I was going to sit down and let you... No, no, no. <laughs> no. You have over 50 years combined experience with Gilded. Easily, yeah. And um, they have their studio in Rawlingsford, and they are going to talk to you all about the, this beautiful art. So please welcome Ron and Jared. <laughs> Thank you. Pardon? Is it in the mills? Yes, Lower Mill. <coughs> About 1,800 square feet. Mm, yeah. Um, isn't that right? Yeah. Close to that. Yeah. So I thought that I would talk to you a little about the manufacture of gold leaf, how it's turned into leaf. Um, and Jared will talk to you a little bit about uh, methods that uh, we've used, that Gilders use, with uh, the de decorative arts a little bit. And if at any time, you have a question, put your hand up, because neither one of us wants to be here lecturing. We, we're trying to share some stuff with you, but we want to give you what you came here to learn. So, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Uh, gold's wonderful stuff. <laughs> Everybody wants it. I read somewhere that uh, um, the amount of gold that so far we have taken out of the Earth, uh, planet-wide, would fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's all there is. That, which, I mean, they're big pools, but it doesn't seem like a lot to me, right? Anyway, that's it. And this is one of the reasons why there's so much of it around, because there isn't much of it here. Um, yeah, we're going to give you a piece of gold to leave, to hold in your hands here in a few minutes. Um, gold leaf is about anywhere down to a tenth of a micron thick. It's so thin that actually, oh. if you walk around, yeah. <laughs> you have trouble with it. Yeah. We have a, a closed-in room with a big picture window in it. If anyone wants to watch us guild, they're at the outside of the room. I was working with gold one day, doing what Jared's doing. I just flattened a leaf out on my pad. I was ready to cut, and, cut it in half. I cut it in half. And a fly went by about three inches over the pad, and both halves of that leaf came up in the air about two inches and settled back down on the pad. Interesting. So this is a piece of 23 karat gold stuck on a piece of acrylic. And if you take it and, and hold it and look through it, just touch the clear part, mm -hmm. um, you should be able to see the lights through it. Yeah. On a good sunny day, you can look out the window and see things out there. You can pass it right around. It's all right. Um, traditionally, a long time ago, they used to pound gold with mallets. And there are stories in, in Italy about the time of Cennino Cennini. They had big buildings with wide board floors, and the building would be full of gold beaters. 
and they'd have a hammer like this and they'd have a book called a, a kutch and it was pieces of leather, uh, lamb's leather, and gold would be sort of, I don't know how they started then, it, it, little spots of it or, or cut squares of it or some, I don't know what they did, but they'd put it in the center of these pages, there'd be about 20 pages of it, and they would put that on the top of a flat cut hardwood tree stump and pound it and turn it and pound it and pound it until they got some size to those pieces. They would then open the cutch and take those pieces, cut them in quarters and put them in another 20 book. So pretty soon they've got all these leather cutches around full of pieces of gold and start pounding again. And they would keep pounding it and pounding it and making it thinner and thinner. Now the hand pounded gold was a little thicker than what we use today. Um, they couldn't, they just couldn't, they didn't have the control, How but they make this, one? This, is, this is done, I, I watched three different uh, films today for, for how they're doing it today. They're, they're using one, a mechanical hammer, um, and two, in most cases, they're using paper rather than leather to separate it, and they're very, uh, very organized. They take the gold, they pour it into bars, they run the bars through, thank you, through a, a roller mill to get them the same thickness and the same width. And then they just keep rolling it and rolling it and rolling it until it's a ribbon of gold. And then they measure it out. They know how thick all of that is. They measure out identical pieces and fill a clutch, a paper clutch, and wrap paper around it and then use it under this hammer device. And then again, same thing comes. They cut it up, put it into more, and they, they go down until they get to half a micron thick or a tenth of a micron, somewhere in that. It's amazing. It's, there's almost nothing there. Hi, hi Ron. Hey, hey, how are you? Yeah. I was thinking about coming here tonight, and I was wondering, is the gold that you have in those books the same gold that goes on the dome in Boston? Is it, or is there a different kind of exterior gold that's thicker? It's thicker. It may be a tiny bit thicker, but not much. Um, it's called patent gold, and we have some here in a, it, we'll show you an example of it. it it's, it's lightly adhered to a separate piece of paper. When you, when you open a regular book of gold, as Jared's done here, the, the leaf is loose in the book. Now this is a book that someone gave me, and they've, they've gone through it and busted all the gold up. So we're going to use some of that to pass out to you. But the patent gold has a separate sheet inside, a piece of white paper, and it's on it because you're outside using this mostly. If you're up on a dome and they put a piece of this, th this allows them to handle it in the wind, even though they put barriers around and everything. If a fly goes by, they're in trouble. So, they're, so that's how it's handled. And they use bigger sheets. They have it custom made maybe 12 inches by 12 inches. And the, uh, the paper in these, in these little books, these individual sheets of paper, have a tiny little bit of jeweler's rouge on them, which is an extremely fine red powder. And that keeps the gold from sticking to the paper. But the, the patent, the white paper they use for the patent, doesn't have, or doesn't have as much on it. So, so the gold, the gold sort of sits more tightly. So you can just lay it down and press lightly and lift the paper. Now you must peel the paper off that once you put it on. Yes. Yeah. Now all the, all the scrap pieces, that, uh, can you bring those together and pound them together and make it, will it stick together? If we, if it we took, will. If we took yeah. all the gold that we have at the table here and gathered it all together and, and rolled it up into a little thing that we could hammer out again, you almost wouldn't be able to see it. What? You, you wouldn't, wouldn't be able, be able to see it. it anymore. You'd wonder where it was in your hand. Yeah. We're, really, we're going to give you a piece of gold There's now so little actual you. gold here, it's like a grand illusion. It's kind of fascinating. <laughs> but it's amazing, and these, there's you, one you I, tell I me when recommend you go online and watch how it's done in Japan. I've, it's done, it is a particular city, the city of the gold beaters, it's Kanazawa, which also has some tie-in to the samurai warriors too, I don't know why. But anyway, Kanazawa, um, I think Kana is the... Japanese word for gold, I think. Shall I throw uh, some gold at them? Oh, yeah. 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 Mm. I'll so give you guys each a piece. Yeah. You can play with it. It's yours once I give it to you, because it won't, it won't let yeah, go of you. Yeah, food gold, now you're talking. That's 24 carat, or should be. Oh, this is... Because as, oh. as carat drops oh. down, 23, 22, 21, there's another okay. you're uh, happy? element in there. There's copper or silver 
or or it may be uh, I can't even think of what it is. It's, it's a very like silver. It's a South American mineral, but they're combined. Um, so the color of the gold changes, and also what we have here is a book. I'll show you that it's it's very different. It's um, made of gold. It's uh, copper or brass. Or which will show you a variety of golds. Yeah, if, it, if it comes again, if, if it's well, as difficult to handle as this is, you should take a piece. Yeah. If, this, if this acts the same as what you Yeah, um, because the, it changes the color of the gold. The character of the gold will change it. It depends on whether it's silver's added, keeps it lighter, maybe even a tiny bit greenish. If, if copper's added, it gets more reddish. So by the time you take the number of different the number of carats you can have a 14, uh, 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 24, 23, it's not to eat, Grant. Oh, you got yours. You're good. Okay. A sheet of gold. No, hold on. Um, what, what would you guess is going for a book today? Uh, probably about 45 or 50 if you're buying we buy them bulk so we buy boxes of books if you go to main artisan craftsman or hobby lobby or, or somewhere and if you can buy genuine gold leaf you'll probably pay about twice that so you'll be paying about three to four dollars per sheet if you and go there are 20 sheets in there so it's just $60. you'll be buying a book like this so <coughs> yeah 70 yeah. 70 dollars i think I, I had to buy some on short notice recently and i was astounded anyway yeah. Um, yeah. But and it's mm -hmm. patent palladium. Yeah, palladium is the other thing they would add to to a gold. Of, was it straight palladium or was it a mix of was straight palladium? Because that's a that's all comes from uh, South America, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So there's nothing, gold is the most uh, malleable metal that we have, period. So it's the one that can be beaten out the thinnest and still retain that suppleness. Uh, so you can get, do you need another one? No, it's all right. You can roll it up. See yeah, how take it. Yeah, ball you we can can't take it, it back. It's, it's just. We, we, we gave it to you to, to play with. It goes, it's good for you. If you we get, they used to, well, that was when they first started putting it in food because they felt it would be good for them. They would add it to food, they'd put it in their booze, and you can still get it. Yeah. Uh, in the, at the liquor store, you can find stuff you can shake. Up. Yeah, yeah. I, gold is inert, so it doesn't matter, I don't think, unless it might make you more allergic to the electric. You might be a better conductor of electricity or something, but. I don't. I think it would That's just cool. pass yeah. through your yeah, body. It's, it, yeah. it's not going to yeah. yeah. mix so with anything. Cool. What was it supposed to do? You to what? Well, the body. I, I don't know anyone who was doing that then. <laughs> no. What was, if, if you ingested it, what was it supposed to? What, well, what, uh, what was it going to cure when they did, used it medicinally? I don't know. Uh, in, Arthritis, in ancient, maybe. In ancient but Chinese philosophy, they believed that if you subsisted on a diet of like gold and. You know, if you had cinnabar, which is mercury oxide, which is really not a good thing to eat, you, you could attain immortality. Sooner. <laughs> if you want to go for it, I power to you. Cinnabar. Yeah, cinnabar. cinnabar. Yeah. Um, uh, and the gold, the gold leaf is uh, graded by carat. So 24 gold leaf is the edible gold leaf that you'd find in a bottle of Goldschlager or on chocolates with a little piece of gold or that sort of thing. That's 24 carat. That is as pure as gold can get. Hmm. We do a lot of work with 23 carat, which just has a small uh, impurity in it. And they have the, the colors change. Did you bring that book? I thought I did. I thought I had it tucked That's in a, one of these bags. Uh, I thought uh, I put it on the bottom of it. You'd know better. I don't know. I don't um, know. I'm starting to think I left half of everything home. So the more, the more gold in it, it has the, uh, the more you can pound it out and work with it. Um, and then Two your bags. color shifts down from like a, like a deeper, rich gold down to like a 22 karat gold and then down to like an 18 karat gold and then all the way down to what they call white gold and further this has got this is 12 karat gold in gilding so it's uh you know, 60 percent gold still and the silver has given it a really pale color 
Um, yeah. Is, is the lesser gold less shiny? No. It is not less shiny. Uh, it is slightly less expensive, but unless you actually switch over to buying silver leaf, um, it, it doesn't get less expensive very quickly at all. You're still up in the three to four dollars a sheet range. The the alternative, the really inexpensive alternative, we sort of talked about briefly, is called metal leaf, uh, and this is pounded brass, and you can handle it really easily with your hand. Uh, it might stick, it might tear, but it's much more durable. But it also it's a lot thicker. Is incredibly inferior in a number of ways. No. You can't burnish that. That is that is one actually, of its main failings. Actually, I, I'll, and it I'll back up a little on that because the Swedes are doing it. They're 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 putting on a metal leaf and they're burnishing it. Um, I'm I'm assuming they're putting it on a clay finish as we do for all of these that we burnish. But the problem with it is that it's not inert, so eventually it's going to start to tarnish, so it won't stand up. Some of these, you know, get, get an old frame like this, and that gold's been there for a long, 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 long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't tarnish, and, and anything with that metal leaf on it eventually will degrade. Mm -hmm. And it, even silver's a problem. Silver's wonderful stuff, but on old frames, it will tarnish. I almost brought some old books of silver leaf to show you, just sitting in the paper. It, it's all burned and discolored on the edges. And I have an old book of the metal leaf, too. And when you open it up and look at it, it's just been sitting in the book, but probably for 20 years. It's all got this kind of funny, mottly look to it. It discolors. Mm. This stuff doesn't. And the, the inertness of it is what makes it so ideal for the capital dome or any sort of exterior thing. Because if you're using pure gold, once you put it in place, nothing is going to happen to it. it It'll, unless, unless abrasion takes it away by, like, ice pelting or seagulls up on the dome, like that kind of thing will wear through it. Sandstorm. Sure, but um, it itself, it's never going to rust, it's never going to tarnish. Um, you're, you're, you're much sooner going to see degradation of whatever you use to adhere it, or if they tried to put something over it to protect it, when that, you know, goes to pieces due to sunlight or whatever, that, that'll tear the gold apart and that'll be the end of it. But the gold itself will just stay there. Um, it's, it will last, it will outlast any finish you could put on it. Yeah. Just for, on this, I don't know, I got here late, but how did That's you right. get into the business of this, Ron? Could you just briefly tell us like, well, how you started Really on? fast. When I was in high school, I worked in a frame shop in Portsmouth for a couple of years. Uh, I left that, got married, uh, came back here. When we got, we got back after a couple of years of wandering, we bought land. And the winter between our coming back and our going up and starting to build, I worked part-time in a frame shop in Kittery. And I loaned him a bunch of my tools that I had and went and built and got into building and worked as a, uh, worked as a house carpenter for 10 years. Um, but every year I'd stop and visit the guy at the frame shop, see if I could get my tools back. And he'd say, oh, I can't, I can't. And, and finally, the 10th time I stopped, I was really tired of working outside in Maine winters. <laughs> it, was, it was getting to me. And uh, yeah. I walked in and he said, oh, have a cup of coffee. And his wife and I sat down. He said, oh, wait a minute. And he ran off and he came back with his arm full of tools. I said, what's the deal? He said, well, I'm going to sell a shop and I want to get your tools back to you before I sell it. I thought, oh. And I went home and thought about it and called him the next day. I said, how much? <laughs> and I ended up buying this little shop in Kittery. Well, he had a history of working with a lot of the antique dealers around. So I started getting these frames that I'd never seen before. That, and uh, one of them said, would you? you clean this little? I said, yeah, I'll give it a cleaning. And he went away and a day I got it out and I got the little cotton and water and I took a wipe like that and the whole finish was gone. <laughs> and I called him up a bit. I said, listen, I don't know what I did, but I did something wrong because it's gone. He said, well, that's a gold frame, you know. I said, well, no, I didn't really know that. Not anymore. And that started me on the search. I started reading about gold and gold leaf and, so, and it took me five years to find someone to teach me. I found a, a wonderful old man down in Boston, um, and I drove down there one night a week. And after a year of doing that, I was helping him teach this course that he was doing. And that's how I got into it. And then, of course, the dealers would come to me because I... And then I got into doing restoration, and when Jared finally got of age, he started working with me, and, and we've worked together. So. 
Do you just do, still, still do frame restoration for big, old frames? Did you have pictures of the two you've worked on the last two weeks? Did you bring your computer? I, have, I didn't bring the computer. I didn't have time to load. Yeah, I didn't yeah. have time to load. Yeah, right. I have two small children. I'm yeah, sure. I know. I know. <laughs> we're we're um, just making this up as we go along. So. I know, huh? So, sorry, Grant. He's Surprise. Got, he's got two uh, Louis the Fourteenth wooden hand car frames. In and two children. Yeah. And two children. <laughs> <laughs> and he's taught the kids how to chip this gesso off. Yes, we we do do restorations. Yeah. So. Yeah. He's, he's got some wonderful frames there he's doing, and these are Louis XIV, so they're when? I, give me the year. It's early 18, so late 1700s. Yeah, late 1700s. We still, yeah. I, sh I say we, but it's him now. I'm retired. Yeah. I, yeah. We, we now, we, I say we all the time, uh, make, uh, we reproduce period historic frames, we restore old historic frames, and more modern ones, and, uh, and we guild occasionally very odd things that people want us to do in sculpture and... What's the oddest thing that you, hmm? what's the oddest thing that you had to do? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the oddest thing Ooh. that I've had to do that I could talk about. Uh, I just made a Nobel Prize for someone because they're the Nobel family, so they, that wasn't terribly odd. But uh, um, You don't they, have to describe it. <laughs> You, you, you won the, uh, the odd thing that you gilded prize. I haven't gilded a lily yet. I, mean, I gilded milkweed pods. That's I want kind of I want it. You know, I've been thinking, someone asked me the other day if I could gild a lily. I said, probably. <laughs> uh, when Easter rolls around, I'm going to go get some lilies because I want to see. It may be that they're uh, uh, juicy enough to actually hold the leaf. We did not have to put a size on it. I recall for some, for some obscure reason when I was younger, when he had the shop, and this is not what got me into gilding, but at some point as a prank for my aunt and uncle who raised horses, he, he gilded a piece of uh, horse dung for them. <laughs> Paperweight. So that, 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 my question. that, that, right up your, yeah, okay. Uh, um, yeah. That, but that also uh, begs the question, what is the, uh, the most uh, archaic, valuable, antique, precious, one-of-a-kind frame that you've had to work on? Uh, frame? These these Louis the Fourteenth ones are pretty pretty sweet. Are, the, your your, your Phoenix ones are really interesting. Those Those are really ones really that went out elaborate. West, uh, um, yeah, I, it's a hard question to Chinese answer because and we don't always know the value. Right. I mean, in so many dollars, and we don't keep track of it that way. I, we've had some really beautiful pieces that we've worked on that were very old. I haven't done it from winter to Do you know Al Breed? Um, Al Breed is a a furniture maker. He has studio in the lower, lower or the upper mill at uh, Rollinsford, and he's uh, the most incredible carver in the world. And if the uh, Metropolitan or uh, the Smithsonian or someone uh, needs something replicated, <coughs> Al's the first of three people they'd call in the country. To do the replication, he uses all the hand tools, period tools, and his carving is unbelievable. He learned at the at the MFA, working in their restoration department. He showed up there as a high school student, said, "I want to work in your restoration department," and they kind of looked at him and laughed. And he was in it within a year, and that's where he learned. Um, but he he uh, he uses us for his gilding. He used to take it down to Boston, first New York, then Boston. Now he's here. Do you know anything about clocks? Burt, the Burt, the Burt Dial Company in Exeter, Burt's three generations of clock restorers. Um, and uh, they, used to, they used to take the work down to the guy that I studied with. And he finally said to them, why do you drive down here? Why don't you just go over to Ron and Kittery? And I qualified. I, he accepted my gilding. So. I, I, will, I have just one more quick question. So we were talking about um, frames ourselves coming up because you see a lot of that in antique, the antique world, and a lot of rest, restoring the gesso of the frame seems to be a real skill too, which involves some kind of carving aspect. Do you always create a mold of some repeated pattern that you're doing, or do you have to do freehand if, sculpting with plaster? If they're looking for um, a true restoration. We try to redo it. I'm saying we again now. I'm, 
but with the same materials that were originally used and in a way that they are removable. Oh. How do you identify that differently? Do you not model it quite the same? Well, we no, 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 no. It's it's we, it, there's a separation layer under anything that that we do, so that it actually can be taken away again. And part of that's but, part of that's a fault of the process. I mean, if you yeah. if you have something that's carved in wood, we try and use a carved wooden piece to replace it, and you're going to have a, a glue line. We use a, a hide glue. Yeah. It's reversible you, with heat you've and got water. A, yeah, so it's sort places. of naturally reversible. But if it's if it's made of wood, we replace it with wood. If it's if it's a cast molding, we make molds from another part of the frame, hopefully, that match and put those in place yeah. into the the lapses. Yeah. So, so as much as possible, as nearly as possible, we follow the materials. Yeah. So I mean, and do it the same way. Yeah, a lot of a lot of decorative elements on frames are done with this material called compo which is a uh, cast material. It's got hide glue and rosin and a number of other things. And you activate it with uh, steaming, and that gets the glue all softened up, and you apply it to the frame, and then you can do your work on it. Uh, it's hard to, there's a, there are huge catalogs of this. This stuff was really big for a long time, and you can, you can still get it from certain resources, but uh, oftentimes we run into this, and we'll cast it out of plaster or something. Um, can't, can't find a way to match it. Yeah, so we do, uh, I, I went and took a sculpting degree at a little university near here, um, and I learned nothing. I learned nothing, no. I know. Well, it's because of the staff. <laughs> <laughs> they all wanted him to paint, and he wanted to, yeah. him to, he wanted to sculpt. Anyway, so I... Simple casting, I, hope. I learned simple casting, which is exactly where I was going, which I use all the time now. So, um, so we cast a lot. I, I carve, I'll, I'll recarve gesso and such, uh, depending on the need. So for the restoration, uh, all kinds of different things. But a lot of the new frames we, we carve straight out of wood. And um, that's his carving, right? Yeah. yeah. He's good. Are you teaching somebody else? That's my last question. Are you going to have a I, of some kind of? I'd, I'd be happy to at some point. Yeah. Um, Maybe, maybe when my children are older and I have more time. <laughs> maybe I'll have times. Well, that's what I, maybe Harold. Yeah, right. His son, yeah, four-year-old. Yeah. Um, not yet, but the game's not over. <laughs> um, we were going to guild something, if you want, um, and talk a little bit about the actual gilding process. Sort of that's where the gold comes from. Um, as far as the gilding itself, frames basically made of wood, is a substrate, and then you, if you want to gild on it, um, uh, try and find it. one. Try and find one that's got like uh, a good exposure. Actually, there we go. The one I was going to gild is perfect. Um, you see it or not see it. Uh, so you have wood underneath, and then there's a really thin layer of white over the wood, and that's a gesso. Uh, it's a traditional gesso made with hide glue and chalk whiting, as opposed to. Um, Modern acrylic yeah, gesso. That's specifically a rabbit skin glue, mm. which is used. Uh, it's better than a, uh, ordinary high glue. Yeah, the materials that. Same gesso you put on a canvas, is it? Yeah, mm. some painters use a traditional gesso. You most might use, use it an on acrylic. a panel, but not on a canvas. Yeah, most use a modern acrylic gesso, which would not do the same thing that this does. Uh, this has, it has a lot more body, and because of the. the now, if you use the color rather than white. You, you can, and some do. Does it that won't as much. Uh, between the gesso and the gold, you have the red layer. This is bold. It's a clay. It's also bound with a rabbit skin glue. That has much more of an impact on the color of the finished product. It's a, it, the gold is so thin, as you saw, that when you, when, you get to, well, when you get to the finished product, you can see the color underneath the gold just a little bit. So uh, this guy, this one's, this is a cheat because it's rubbed through a little bit, but it obviously has a red clay under it, so that gives it like a nice warm glow. Uh, the outer part of this one, let me just pop those apart, um, the outer part of this one has a black clay under it, so it has a much kind of cooler feeling to it. Uh, oh, yellow clay. Oh, I lied. <laughs> Still, yellow clay, cooler. Again, I used black on the surface. Anyway. Um, and here so on this, here's an old frame with the gold worn away, and you can see, if you look yeah. closely, you'll see red highlights. Oh, yeah. See where some of the gold is, has worn, and that clay under there is a little deeper red. So could you re-gild that? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Like these guys I brought here. this just to show you yeah. what we might run into in terms of. How do you apply gold over gold? Do you have to use oh, gold yeah. Gold? I would, uh, we clean, no, we clean all this, this first. We, we, well, let, let Jared talk. I'll answer that question separately. That's okay. I'll, I'll tell you about these. These are really cool. And I've got a whole bunch that are kind of like this. Yeah, the Harold Weston ones. Weston's, yeah. yeah. His paintings are awesome, too. Um, so I'm just going to gild something so we can talk about this a little bit. But the, the, the rabbit skin glue is a high glue. It's a protein-based glue. If you heat it up to 50 degrees Celsius, it becomes liquid once you soaked it in water. Um, and then you can work with it. But you have to work with it at temperature for the most part. When you're actually gilding, though, once it's gotten placed onto the frame and it's, it's dried out, um, you go back at it and you wet it. And this is the reason it's called water gilding. This is uh, gilder's liquor, which is basically water. It's like almost entirely water with a tiny little bit of hide glue in it and a tiny bit of alcohol to break the surface tension. Um, so we will take some water on a little mop and wet the... Uh, let's see, I need my... So you've added a little gold. alcohol to that water? There's a little bit of alcohol in there. Um, yeah, that is the gold gold. Yeah, not the patent. I, I asked Nils, the guy that I... Uh, uh, that I learned uh, gilding from. I said, well, how much alcohol do you put in? He said, well, the British, the British would pour a little water in their cup and then they'd take some gin and they'd go like that and swallow and then spit into it. And whatever gin was left in their mouth was enough alcohol. <laughs> uh, Gilders. Um, so we sort of talked about how difficult it is to handle this stuff. Um, when you're, when you're actually gilding with it, uh, you see a couple of things happen which are really cool. First, this is a gilder's tip. This is a sable tip. Um, it has just a few hairs. And you take it and rub it a little bit on your face, maybe by your nose or on your forehead, and that gets a tiny bit of oil from your skin into it. And that's what grabs a hold of the gold. It's not, uh, it's not static, because static can be a real problem. Yeah, um, if it were static, you'd never get the gold off it again. Yeah. So in the, when, in, in, you have to be attentive to the weather on really dry days. It's harder to gild, or if there's a thunderstorm around, that extra charge can make the gold jump. Strangely, it's uh, it's pretty delicate stuff, but it sticks to the brush here. However, um, when I put it on the wet clay, so when I when I wet this, it it very slightly will activate the glue that's in the clay. Not enough to make the clay come apart, hopefully, um, but just enough to make it prepared to grab the gold. So as soon as I touch it, it's just going to jump right down. I'm going to kind of be a little sloppy here, but it's okay. Um, now you slice those, that leaf. Yeah, I, I cut it a little bit. So what you, when you're, when you're gilding, uh, here, I'll move this a little bit. I cut some Sure. You. Um, I don't know if you can see. I just wanted to get out here and cut it where you can see it. Um, where do you um, purchase the um, red clay that you painted? Any number of sources will get you the bowl. Uh, we, yeah, the bowl. Uh, I, I've been getting it from an outfit that makes frames in California, but you can get it from SEP, Gold Leaf Products, SEPP. -E you can get it from... Which um, gold do you use? I was using this guy here, because this is the patent. Um, oh, okay. Uh, you can get it from... Um, you can get it at Maine Artisan Craftsman up in Portland. You can get it from, who's the, who's the outfit down in Boston? Art Essentials? Oh, Art Essentials of New York is... Art Essentials in New York. Yeah, so uh, the bowl has hide glue in it. So it's going to stick because of that. And the benefit of the hide glue is, uh, is it so the water will kind of sink in and dry away. And when it reaches the right consistency, you kind of press the gold down to make sure you get proper adhesion. Um, did you... you know, what, oh, there it is. Um, and the benefit of doing the water lay with all this hide glue, this skunky stuff, right? Yeah, is that the uh, the clay the clay is bound with hide glue, and it kind of has a porous nature. It's a little airy if you were to look at it up very very close to the microscope. Uh, if you take a burnisher, and this is an agate burnisher, it's just a, agate is just a hardness of stone on the scale of the Mohs scale, I think is the hardness scale. Anyway, agate is just a kind of hardness of stone. They polish this really smooth, and this is what you use for burnishing. And if you have clay bound with hide glue, when I run across the clay with this, it's going to compress it down to a really, really smooth surface. So it takes 
uh, I put a little bit of this on earlier today on the front. So if I take my burnisher here and go across that, it goes from being very matte to very polished. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and the more convex or concave the surface is, the more that will really um, sing. Because if it, it catches the light differently depending on the shape of the surface, and that's important in all of these. So that's like the, the fundamental water gilding process right there. And then once you've done this, you can do all sorts of things. So under the gold, there are all kinds of ways you can have different colored clay. You can have lots of textures to activate how it's going to look. And then afterwards, there are a lot of ways you can go back and finish it to sort of shift that around in different directions. Do you have to smooth out that top to make it look smooth? Or, uh, now, when you say you smooth it out, that top there? like up here? Yeah. Uh, I, I, if I were, so I don't need to. <laughs> I could. Um, this, I mean, like, it's pretty rough looking at it. Right, I know, yeah, so it, it does look rough. Um, yeah, that's the question. Um, when, you, when you're constructing this, when you do the gesso, right before you put the clay on, you sand the gesso out, and you sand it right up to like a 320 or a 400 grit, so you've got a really smooth surface. The clay isn't really going to hide anything. It's a very, very, very fine clay. So when you brush that on, if, you've, if you used a, an 80 grit sandpaper or if you've left some dings, those are all going to radiate right up. So you put the gold on top of that, and that's not going to hide anything because it's a tenth of a micron thick. Um, so you've got to get a smooth surface before you put the clay. When you put the gold on, it looks a little rough. If I were to just take and kind of rub any of the extra gold off the areas I haven't burnished, it looks kind of matte, um, a little rough because it's just a rough clay surface. I can burnish it if I want, or I can leave it flat if I want. So you get like, uh, like this one has a burnished lip and then a flat panel. So you can get a kind of push and pull within the frame to get different visual effects that way. The thing um, about gold on a frame is that if the whole frame's gold, it's boring. If it's all it burnished, just, yeah. If you burnish everything, so you burnish some highlights and some hollows and try to give it some character and yeah like this guy here different they burnish the, the outer but not these little panels here they burnish the basically you'll see on older things they'll burnish the round areas and not the concave areas so you have this like lovely glimmering light out here where it's really catching light and then down in the hollows they leave it matte so it it creates some depth visually this, um, is, this is even with all the dirt that's on it mm -hmm. i mean you go through a museum and you walk by a wall and all of a sudden this brilliant glimmer you get and you get back and think what the heck was that it's probably a little spot of burnished gold on a frame that hit the light just right uh, as you were you going back use, um, <clears throat> do you use in your profession other, glue, uh, other adhesives to apply gold uh, to apply the gold yeah so there there are two methods of applying gold basically speaking you have water gilding which we do a lot of but not exclusively and then you have oil gilding oil gilding is what they do the capital dome with Oil gilding, anytime you have to do something outside, uh, you have to use oil gilding because the water gilding, because it's a water based adhesive, is just going to wash rain would away, take with, it away with the rain. Oil gilding, there are a few different methods, but basically speaking, um, you use what's called gilding size. This is an oil based size, it's a slow drying varnish. You brush it onto your surface that you're going to gild, and you wait. This one is. Uh, slow set. So I think this is a 12-hour 12, 12 12 hour size. 12, 12 to 18 hours, probably. So you wait 12 hours, and then you come back to it, and you feel it, and you sort of touch it with the back of your finger and pull it away, and if it makes just the right tick noise, <laughs> you know that it's ready, and then you just start throwing gold at it. And anywhere you've put your size, the gold will stick. And you cover it loosely with gold, and then you grab... And how long does it last uh, workable? Uh, there's an open time... Typically, the longer the, the size, like this is a 12-hour, so it has an open window of maybe two to three hours, oh, easily. maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, the drier it, pardon? Quick set's two hours. Quick well, quick set's ready in half an hour if it's hot you're, enough, and you've got to work fast with it. You're talking yeah, no the more acrylic, than that, right? Probably. It's, it's like a white stuff. Oh, you're the, the sign painter's one? He's yeah. No, he's talking a slow size, a uh, quick size. Quick size. Yeah, rather than a slow yeah, it size. can be two hours, but it isn't yeah. necessarily. It depends yeah. on the, if it's a really dry day. That that can get shortened you pretty can. significantly. You can as much as you can get done on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's 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 a lot faster to gild this one. I have to you know cut each piece and wet the surface and drop them in place and carefully touch them up. When I'm when you're oil gilding, 
you just put the gold on as quick as you can. You take a mop like this and you just start pushing it around everywhere. You work, you have with, all an open, you work with an open book of gold in one hand and you flip the leaves and just drop it onto the frame. Yeah. And then work with your brush, come back and yeah. tap it in. If you missed a spot, you'd bang a little more gold and keep going. And there's Water gold, gilding, there's... individual sheets, yeah. take your time, get everything covered. This is pretty tidy. Different. Oil gilding is gold dust everywhere because you're yeah. pushing it around. It's getting in the edges. It's like glittering everywhere and landing on everything. So this is um, the time-consuming one, but th this is the one that all the old frames are used with. They they basically never used a slow size. They'd put do it all water light and then burnish what they wanted bright. And then they'd mix a little rabbit skin glue in a very thin mix of water. And all the parts they hadn't burnished, they'd cover with that. They called that uh, quickening gold. And that would all, all that um, that you hadn't burnished would kind of pull together in a very wonderful matte finish, matte surface. So you had this sort of velvety looking surface and then the burnished surface. Do you have a varnish over it? No. You, you can? No. Yeah. You can. But yeah, that'll. Not, not a good idea. No. It, well, it'll. So many different things have been done on gold, on frames. So when you're restoring them, that's a real challenge because sometimes they'll shellac over it or sometimes they'll varnish over it or someone will use... If they want to change the color of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You if you want a different tone, tone you can end it waxes or there's a there's hundred different things that people have used over gold. So when you're restoring a frame, it's like a, a puzzle to reverse engineer, maybe undo what they've done. And then if you want to redo it over here, you kind of have to work it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of it, all of it can change the color. So it's a, uh, it's a bit of a puzzle, but that's the nature of the beast. Mm. Yeah. You burnished that one tonight because you said you did it this afternoon. Do you have to let the other one dry? Yes. Know? Yeah. There's a. You have to. Uh, if I, I mean, you can hear. I mean, maybe you can't hear it much, but there's like a. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's much it's much heavier where it's and if I I can show you what I mean if I if I go to burnish this you'll see that it's tearing the gold up and there's a lot of red exposed there, that's because the clay hasn't set back hard enough, uh, and if I wait too long this will get really really it'll harden up so much that I can burnish it but it won't get terribly bright because the clay's just gotten too too hard the glue's hardened up too much. Um, now the humidity effect. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. Oh, your frame. Yeah. If, it, if, if you have them sitting around, will the humidity in the air affect it? Is that the question? It's, yeah, if it's very humid, there's all steam. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it come off, we'll pull, it's off. not going to come off just from humidity in the air. No. Um, it, it really takes uh, a little bit of work to get it off um, once it's set. Um, if you take a wet cloth and you wipe a gilded frame that doesn't have some sort of protective coating over the gold, you can take it off very quickly. Because the yes, water. I did that first frame that I tried to clean. Listen to this. Yeah, uh, I'm going to send this around. Oh, cool! I did you found it. it. All right. But take a look through it page by page. You'll see these are different suppliers of gold, silver leaf, and at the end some metal. All leaf. kinds of wacky. And colors you'll and see. You'll get a sense of the <coughs> change of color in the carrot of the gold and what's added, it tells you what's mm -hmm. added to each If you add silver. copper, you can get a really red gold. If you add silver, you know, there's a whole world of that. Um, Why yeah. do you call it rabbit skin glue? Because it is made from the skin <laughs> of rabbits. Yeah. yeah, it's a hide glue, yeah. just the way a hide glue is made from, I don't know, cow's feet and, yeah. and yeah. cow's hides. Yeah. It's protein-based glue, but it, um, it's, it's a very strong, strong glue, but it sets up quickly. So furniture makers don't use it. It's, it's almost too good. For, too, they too can't fast, work fast yeah. enough to get the joints together. But uh, it's excellent for gilding, and that's been the traditional glue forever. It's, it's one of the strongest, and it's one of the fastest settings. Yeah. There's some, some fish glues that are stronger. Sturgeon glue Sturgeon, is stronger. Yeah. Ice and glass. There's silver leaf as well. You yeah, There's silver You'll leaf. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you get as the further you get from gold, the more you have to consider sealing your surface because it can and will tarnish. Uh, especially if you're using metal leaves, you really have to seal it up well because because that'll turn brown pretty quickly when it's left in the air. Um, yeah. The other thing I thought would be just kind of cool is to gild a a ball. This is kind of a fun. I don't know if you want to. 
if you can see inside this bowl from there, but um, yeah, to get a good piece of gold. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. grab one of my little new pieces of gold for this that. This is this is really um, a fun thing. You got, you can come up around if you want to see. They don't this have a, happen. No, a lot of old frames uh, have as decorative features on them: little balls stuck into them around the top, like under a scoop. Um, or around inside a circular frame in a, in a scoop, they'll put around these the top gilded of a clock spheres. Under the, under the top piece of the clock. So we've restored a bunch of those, and this is, I don't know if you, if you came up with this, but, or where you, where you learned about this method. This is just like, to my mind, kind of the, the funnest way to put gold onto something. Um, so, and you can see here what happens when the gold touches the water. You're not, when I'm, when I'm gilding on the frame, Oh, I was gesturing, but you can take that, okay. thanks. Um, when you're gilding on the frame, I get pretty close with the gold, because as it, as it gets, as it touches the That's water, okay. just move that way a it bit. jumps right oh, down. Oh come, over, oh, come over here. Stand yeah. right behind him and you'll see it. When the gold touches the water, it jumps it onto the frame, and if I start too far away, or if I touch with the lower part, and I've got the high part up in the air, it can actually tear the gold, just the action of the water sucking it down. So when I drop this onto the surface of the water, you'll see that happen pretty dramatically. Um, yeah, I, that was a terrible drop. <laughs> it'll work. Yeah, it'll work. Um, and it's surface tension. Um, so to gild these guys, um, you can drop, hopefully better than that, a sheet of gold Remember, you brushed water, water, water onto that frame, the, the, the water on the frame to prepare it to put mm. the gold on. So is there a bowl on that? Yeah, so this is a, this is a wooden ball on a stick, it's got bowl on it. It's all ready for the gilding, and so he's just brushing water on it. Stick there. it under the water here. Oh, very Come right clever. up in the middle of the gold there, and it it just so floats right smart. down around it. I missed a whole big piece, but there's not much I can do about that. I don't think. No. It's can you come under it? Not again. It'll come off. It's all right. It gets the. So that was my the, question. You the can point keep across. Piecing it together. And yeah, you can. Tiny little lines, but it's still. Yeah, it's yeah I mean, if I. There, yeah, I could. Oh, I've got plenty of gold sitting around. We <laughs> yeah, can just. Too bad. We can just. Uh, uh, Push the ball, though. It. Oh, hand good. gild it. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. So once you've put down a layer of gold onto something, that's a single gilding. In some cases, especially where they really want like a strong polish on a frame, they'll do what's called double gilding where they'll just go right back over, you know, if you did that on just the lip of this frame, for instance, um, you just go right back over with the water again, drop a whole second layer of gold onto it. Now you've double gilded it. So when you burnish it, you won't get as much color coming through, but it's, its reflective quality will kind of be bumped up a notch. It just takes water notch. once again. You don't need to re-glue it or anything. No, no. Yeah. And you actually have to be really careful with that because if you, if, because your water, your gilder's liquor has a little bit of hide glue in it, if you get some out onto a surface that you're not then putting gold back over, oh, it'll leave a kind of visual stain on it. Um, yeah. But these don't have, unfortunately, with the frame, there's a lot of wood behind it to suck the water in. So it gets ready pretty quickly. Uh, with the spheres, there's a pretty finite amount of space for the water to escape to. So it's a little bit more of a delicate process to get it pushed Harold all down. Do. This is what Harold has to learn to do. Yes, my Next son. Next in line. My son. Next yeah. He's he's stuff. only four, right? So he's got some. <laughs> but we've he. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I did a, I did a demonstration in the kitchen for them of this a little while ago, and then we got into gilding chocolate balls, and we would they would they would dip the chocolate ball under and then eat it. It was fun. Um, anyway, I worked last summer with someone up on Monhegan Island, chocolatiers. The, that God knows why they so. were making chocolates on, Mon on the middle of the ocean, yeah. chocolate and water. Mm. Oh, but they were doing it, yeah. And they wanted Every, to know how to put gold on. <laughs> so my ex-wife, who was a chocolatier, was up there, and then I was up there the following oh, week. Um, so they got the benefit of both of our experience, you know, how to gild their chocolates. Yeah. Um, are, there, are there any questions? Any more questions? I'd be happy to entertain them. Could you them. just a minute just tell people about this marvelous uh, structuring you've done of framing, adding that brace and the... Because part of you this talking, is oh, that, sure. that there's yep. the structures have to hold the gold. The gold, this is all about time. Mm -hmm. And you've created these incredible 
I speak from experience. These yeah. beautiful frames that don't just simply join. They have this, what do they call it? It was so in those 14th it's century a, frames. A tapered, yeah. tapered dovetailed spline driven, driven oh. in. Yeah, yeah, you can see this one. I cut it. I cut it right end. through. I just cut this off a corner sample. Absolutely. I was never going to use. So that you can see the the spline in there. In um, yeah, when when we make these, so at one point in in restoring frames, he noticed that in some really old frames, because eventually what happens, wood wood moves every time it gets moisture in the air. The wood's going to move a little bit. It moves across the grain. It shrinks. So this this shrinks this way, which is when you when. Right. Trim carpenters have to pay attention to this when they're trimming out corners of things because gaps will open up if they're not careful. Um, so typically what happens on a frame is this inside corner will split and open up. So you because have a V-shaped crack the frame the corner. The frame's shrinking the and pulling. <clears throat> this corner can't go anywhere. It's going to stay pushed together. And so what's going to happen here is that it's going to open up on the inside. That happens pretty consistently on old frames. But um, he was finding that certain frames really resisted that and it was in uh, Europe for the most part for a while they were using these tapered dovetailed splines in the corner this is most, most of them weren't tapered Why that was okay. really hard addition do? well it makes it a lot easier to put it in drives oh, okay. it so it drives yeah. it, it they yeah. would put straight splines in parallel yeah. sides yeah. so they would have to slide in and they weren't tight enough really cool. this one we can drive in yeah. and force it into that grain so it's an incredibly cut tight. Yeah, so we yes. have we, we have cut a channel that's dovetailed too. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. it's it's locked down and We've, locked sideways. Yeah. So we built jigs for the spline and for the the making of the channel. So we do it mechanically. So it's yeah. really precise. Yeah. And you you hammer the spline in and it locks it in three directions. Why can't it be brought back to Twitter? What this one? Yeah. Um, oh, it can be. It's dirty. It's old. How it's got. You, how would you clean that? Carefully. Uh, very carefully. <laughs> but because it's also a water lay. But I, I would, honestly, I buy a, a, cl a cleaner that's made in England. It's miscible with either water or with mineral sure, spirits. I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in this case, I would mix it with mineral spirits and then very carefully with a Q-tip go over this lightly and start to lift the, the dirt off. Now, in reality, I could probably clean this thing, and the only thing I'd need to do, the gold is pretty much there, except for a little wear. Why? It's that's part of the beauty of it. It's just got more life. Um, leave that as it is. Here, where it's a, a water lay and unburnished, I might quicken it again just to homogenize it. But all the dirt will be away, and it would be the all the carving would just be still alive. Uh, so not do too much. It, it's possible to re-gild it. I mean, Jared's got two. Yeah. Hand carved French ones that are about this big on portraits and they're uh, incredibly well carved and they need a lot of work on the wood. So he's had to strip everything off. He's going to have to regild them totally. Yeah, I spent, so I spent get, 16 hours. You, you should see them when they're removing done. the old They'll gesso. Knock your socks off. <laughs> but it's going to take them a month of building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but they're, yeah, they're worth it. So Charge you I am. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's for historic New England. It's for the the Otis House. The other the That's other thing we discovered with these splines, we started making really large frames with them. So we had a frame in one time that was about four feet by six feet, and I happened to walk by it one day and I looked at it, and I got down and looked along the top of the frame. It bowed down, and came back up, and I looked at the bottom piece, and that one bowed up and came back. Because the wood could not pull apart here, it created a tension, and the tension went into bowing the sides rather than it, it couldn't move here. But there would have been accordingly on the back of the painting such a strong structure. That right, if there was a painting in it, yeah. I think well, this yeah, one but was, it, but this it one was, was. I mean, you, you, you leave a, a, a space for, the, for that painting. Yeah. It's right, not like the bowing down, yeah, but yeah, but it's that strong that yeah. that joint doesn't pull apart. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, seven o'clock. All right. <laughs> it's seven or seven thirty? What are we? We'll keep talking, but I think the the ladies are going to want to go home. <laughs>